It has to be the ultimate in frustration for students, their parents, and their teachers. Seemingly very bright kids just can't seem to learn what's being taught in class. They fall far behind and become very down on themselves. It's a problem John Heath has been studying since 1988 when he founded an applied research company called Learning Techniques in Salt Lake City. Working with new findings on how the brain works, John Heath believes he's found an overlooked answer to why bright kids can't learn. They are conclusions he was asked to present at Oxford University and that he shares with us. Usually uh, a child is, uh, is intelligent. The parent feels they're intelligent. They see some things that they do around the house and they know that they're bright. Uh, however, they have, they have taught this child, perhaps taught the child to death, but the teaching is not sticking. So they can't figure out why is this bright child not able to learn. And so they'll, they'll try some tutoring and they'll try different things and they'll work hard at home and then they, then they come to me and say, we've tried everything now. Uh, what's your suggestions? A child like this is usually frustrated, really good at some things, uh, but they have some things they're not so good at, so the parent says, now, what's wrong? How come you can do math but you can't read? And so it's real frustrating for the parent uh, and it's frustrating for the child because neither one of them know what's wrong. They know what the symptoms are and they probably have been addressing those symptoms for a number of years by the time I see them. But the, the uh, repetitions that are usually used to try to remedy that kind of thing don't work on a permanent basis. As long as the, the repetitions are, are going on, usually the child does better. But the minute those, all that special help stops, they start to struggle again because the underlying problems are still there. They weren't addressed. As we mentioned, John Heath himself had a difficult time learning. I was uh, struggling with learning. I, I was not a good student and uh, I had good parents, however, and uh, they, uh, tutored me to death, but it didn't, didn't, uh, didn't really, didn't help very much. And they kept telling me I was, I was uh, uh, smart, but I couldn't do, I couldn't do what other kids could do. So I thought, well, they're just telling me that. Uh, it's not really true. They just love me and they're just telling me that. Uh, and, uh, but I had a personality trait that was helpful and that was that I was tenacious. So even though I couldn't do things the way other people did things, I figured out ways that I could succeed and I used those approaches to, to beat my way through school. John Heath became even more interested in learning when his son exhibited the same learning problems he experienced as a child. I had a son and he started doing the same things I did and I knew what was wrong. Furthermore, I knew what the next 40 years of his life was going to be like. So I was driven to try to find a solution for him. Now, I knew what didn't work, because I'd already been down the road, but I didn't know what did work. So I began to look, and uh, that brought me to learning techniques and uh, the research that, that we've carried out there. John Heath says a key to understanding learning is that it involves two phases. The first phase is sometimes called the scholastic phase or the instructional phase and uh, most everybody understands that you have to be taught or you can't learn and so that teaching comes through schools uh, through special uh, special programs that schools have uh, resource kinds of programs parents often get involved and they'll try to help uh, by giving a child additional repetitions uh, tutors are employed and they do the same thing. So all those people are involved in dispersing information to an individual. And that's what's involved with that, with the scholastic phase. Then the second phase uh, is called a neurological phase of learning. And that's where each one of us mentally capture these incoming pieces of information and we process those pieces, mentally process them. And as this processing takes place, the product of learning begins to be produced. 
So people who have trouble with that phase usually have average and many times above average intelligence. Uh, so it's not a problem of intellect. They usually have been taught adequately. So it's not that the teaching's been poor either. But what they are having trouble doing is turning teaching into learning or they're having trouble with that processing part. And you usually see those symptoms, those struggling symptoms fairly early in their uh, life and those problems tend not to get better as the years go on. So learning techniques works exclusively with that second phase. John Heath's journey to solve the mystery of why bright kids can't learn took a lot of research. He had to assemble a team of experts, observe how children are taught, and eventually look for clues out at the cutting edge of brain research. Well, we had two goals. One was we wanted to know why seemingly bright children struggle with learning. And the second goal we had was we wanted to know how to fix those problems. So as we uh, began this research, we formed a, a group of people, a program board, consisting of five doctors all having MD or PhD designation. And what we started with is we really started with uh, curriculum. We thought perhaps the curriculum that schools were using wasn't very good, or maybe their implementation of that curriculum wasn't very good. But as we examined all that, we didn't find any big flaws there. And then it was kind of like lightning struck. And we realized that the problem wasn't the school, it wasn't the teacher, it was the child. And we'd been looking in the wrong place. That's why we couldn't find the answers we were looking for. So we began looking at the child and determined that, that, that 20% uh, of the children have a difficult time taking the information that the teacher is giving them and processing it and turning it into learning. So the teacher teaches a class and 80% get it and 20% don't. And the teacher doesn't know what's wrong. She's taught them all the same. So then they go to the, the next year and the same thing happens. And the next year, those same 20% just struggle year after year. So um, then when we determined that it was a child uh, and that they were having a difficult time processing information, uh, then, what we, then we needed to find out, well, what specific processes do they have trouble with? But what was not there is how do you fix those processes? The thought at the, at the time was that they can't be fixed that what you have to do is you have to learn to live with what you've got and just do the best you can. You're just going to have to work harder, you're going to have to have more repetitions, but that's, that's your lot in life. It's too bad, but that's the way it is. But that wasn't good enough for us. We thought, no, 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 no. John Heath says his biggest breakthrough came from new brain research. Once thought to be fixed, we now know the brain has incredible abilities to rewire itself. We've been repairing uh, poor processing with stroke victims for years. And we realized that, that the same processes that they used to improve the way a damaged brain worked would work with someone who was having learning problems, who maybe didn't sustain damage but there was maybe some development that just didn't occur adequately. So we began to develop procedures by which we could, we could create small strains in those underdeveloped circuits. And pretty soon, that weak circuit was much stronger than it used to be, so the individual could do things that they couldn't do previously. More on how learning techniques harnesses the brain's powerful ability to change and adapt when American Health Journal continues. What percentage of children who have reading difficulties have vision problems? A, 10%, B, 25%, or C, 50%? The answer is C, 50%. Since 75 to 90% of all a child learns comes to him via the visual pathway, if there is a problem, the child will not develop to his maximum potential. The learning techniques approach to helping bright kids overcome their learning problems involves performing a series of carefully designed exercises. 
They are exercises that at first glance would seem to have little to do with learning. But as John Heath will explain, they have everything to do with training the brain. Learning techniques uses a, uh, uh, a technique called physio-neurotherapy. And that technique ut utilizes the plasticity of your brain and causes your brain to remodel areas of weakness. You will use four one-inch colored stickers for this exercise. The arms will be straight at the sides with both feet on the floor. Instruct the student to look down at the stickers and raise the hand and knee with the pink stickers. Then return them to their original starting position. Repeat the movement using the hand and knee with the yellow stickers. Continue working on this exercise until the student can easily raise the right hand with the left knee and the left hand with the right knee without hesitation or difficulty. Sometimes people will, will uh, look at an activity like this and say, that's dumb. They, because they think that you're working with a person's legs and hands. You're not working with their legs and hands. You're working up here. So you're not working down here, you're working up here. You're working with the circuits that are causing or making it possible for you to make these movements. So sometimes people, as they see these activities, they, they say, oh, I, could, I can do that in an easier way, and they can. But you won't get the strain that's going to create the gain that's going to change your life. The following exercise is designed to train the eyes to converge or focus synchronically on an object or moving object while maintaining a clear visual image. This ability is vital during the process of reading. And people who have trouble finding uh, things with their eyes often have a lot of difficulty reading because reading is a heavy tracking job. Your eyes have to go from letter to letter to letter and word to word to word and line to line to line. You can't skip things. Uh, and you can't take them in in an unusual order. Uh, and so in our testing, one of the things we want to know is whether a person's eyes track. Both eyes should stay firmly fixed on the eraser as you move the pencil to about three inches from the nose. And then you say, okay, look at the eraser on this pencil, and then you can, you, you can just count to yourself, or you can use a timer. So you look at the eraser, and then you look at this eraser, and you look back and forth. And what you want to do is you want to follow their eyes, see the track their eyes take. And what you'll see is you'll see their eyes will sometimes overshoot, and then they'll come back to the eraser. Sometimes they'll track, and they'll hit the bottom of the pencil, and then come up and find the eraser. Sometimes they'll just kind of quiver, and then they'll move. And when you see those things, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, that's a big problem. No wonder that child skips words, uh, reads the same line twice, and so on. The activity that has stickers uh, in it, stickers on both hands and on your legs, is designed to get uh, the different parts of your brain to talk to each other. And that ability to communicate is critical to memory. People who can't do that will have a lot of trouble with 24-hour memory. That is, you go to school, you're taught something, you go home, then you come back to school, and you can't remember it. So it has to be retaught. And that happens over and over and over. And it's very frustrating for the teacher, because uh, she's not making any progress, and it's real frustrating for the child, because they think there's something wrong with them. So this activity is designed to get both sides of your brain, and actually within those sides, get different components to talk to each other uh, on cue. This exercise not only enhances the student's fine motor skills, but also creates a situation in which detailed information contained on one side of the brain must be shared with the other side. You start out with, with this kind of an activity, but that's not enough. That, that's, that starts uh, uh, the circuits being used uh, and a strain being uh, created, but not a heavy enough strain to get probably where you want to go. And so you start with this simple thing with, and then you go to more and more complicated things because you want to keep this overload occurring uh, so that you can get uh, the, the volume of circuits that you need to perform well in school and in other parts of your life. More on giving young people the tools they need to learn when we come back.